It's nice to yeah. see a good turnout. I was worried that everybody would still be sleeping, so this is great. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, we started the session this morning with movement and finding center in your body. And Kara was an amazing teacher. We, we learned to walk, think about, thinking about our senses in our bodies and getting really centered in knowing and owning your body. So the segue to this conversation, when it's so scary knowing that somebody else is owning our mind and working on buying our brains, and that is why Susie wrote this book, Freedom to Think, and she really brings out this fear that these technology companies are taking over without us even knowing and understanding it, the way we think and the shape, the way we communicate with each other. So Susie, you are like a world known human rights lawyer, so why this, why now? Well, for me, the, the trigger for thinking about freedom of thought was Cambridge Analytica. It was the first time I read about it in 2017, before it became big news. And reading just about, not about the company per se, but about what it was doing, about political behavioral micro-targeting, this idea that through your social media feed, a, a company or a politician might be able to understand your psychological and emotional vulnerabilities understand maybe which way you're gonna vote in a crucial election, and then use that same social media platform to manipulate how you think and feel, and therefore your voting behavior. So, you know, this was reported in relation to Brexit and Trump, and it's not, you know, like identifying someone as a Remainer and making them vote leave, but it's maybe identifying someone as a Remainer and then making them feel that it's all absolutely fine and they don't really need to bother to go out to the voting station if it's raining because it's all in the back. It's this kind of tweaking. It's much more subtle than people sort of felt. And when I looked at that, a lot of the discussions were about privacy and data protection and uh, election finance. And I thought, this is absolutely freedom of thought. This is about ideological freedom. This, is, this goes to the heart of it. And for me, it was a massive wake-up call. You know, I'd, I'd worked on privacy in relation to borders, counterterrorism. You know, I'd written countless policy papers about privacy, but I never really felt it. And this one, I just thought, my God, this is about, you know, this is about me. It's about everyone around around me, and it's not about whether you're clever enough to see the manipulation. The point of manipulation is you don't know it's happening. Uh, the book just came out a couple of weeks ago to like great reviews around the world, but, and you did a lot of research, but it's really current and really new. Yeah. And, and one of the things you talk about that's kind of dear to my heart because it's, it's in the media business is Elon Musk, carry out the world's richest man, who thinks that he can just go and buy Twitter and unleash hate speech to everyone, and, and that's okay, and we can't do anything about that. And you've done some research on Elon Musk, and he's also trying to explore how to get directly into your brain which dad, my husband, said, yeah, he's inventing ears. Yeah. But, you know, but that is a neuroscience that he is uh, exploring. Yes? Absolutely. And what I sort of found, the more research I did, was that almost any direction of technological development is based on an idea that we can be hacked, essentially. And, and that is the way it goes, whether that's in big data and AI or whether that's in neurotech. And yeah, Elon Musk is developing Neuralink, which is the idea that you'll have this chip and, you know, uh, often it's talked about as this will be great for people with locked-in syndrome. It's like, well, fantastic, then ban it for consumer use. If it's just about locked-in syndrome, let's say we're never, ever going to be in a position where we can put a chip in our brain and then people can directly read our thoughts and manipulate our thoughts directly. But if you think about, yeah, the power structures of having one person potentially owning you know, th this kind of neurotech development, but also owning our information flows and controlling information flows. And when you hear, you know, Elon Musk talking about being a free speech absolutist, in international human rights law, freedom of expression is grouped together with freedom of opinion and freedom of information. And one of the really interesting things about the way human rights law works is that freedom of expression can be limited for a variety of reasons. You know, hate speech is not protected by freedom of expression law. Freedom of information is absolutely needed to develop our thoughts and our opinions. But freedom of opinion, insofar as it is what's going on inside your head, is protected absolutely. As soon as you tell someone what you're thinking, what your opinion is, then you can take the consequences of that in the real world. 
But while it's just you developing and thinking about what you think and feel, that is protected absolutely. And it's got three aspects. One is the right to keep your opinions to yourself, so you don't have to share what you're thinking. The second part is the right not to be manipulated. And the third part is not to be penalized for your thoughts alone. So for people to, to make judgments about you just because of what you think. And one of the important things there as well, which I think goes to the previous session, is that the drafters of international human rights law recognize that inferences about what you're thinking can be as dangerous as actually getting it right. So it doesn't matter if the AI gets you completely wrong. You know, if the AI analyzes your walk and decides that you're a person who needs to be in prison, <laughs> it doesn't matter whether or not the AI got you wrong. Now, you have some pretty good examples about uh, how the world sees you through social media. And for yourself, you did some testing. And one was from Twitter, which clearly <laughs> sees her as a 30-year-old man. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the other one was on Facebook that says you're obsessed with wool, which I get. Yep. <laughs> and uh, Justin Bieber. Explain yep. that, will you? Uh, I have yeah. no <laughs> idea where Justin Bieber came from. Yeah, when I looked at, you know, in Facebook, you can go and see what your interests are. Yes, and mine was, it was Jean-Claude Juncker, which was kind of like, well, okay, you know, I used to work for the European Union, so maybe wool, you know, I grew up on a sheep farm, so maybe, but yeah, Justin Bieber, who knows? But similarly, I don't know how, you know, this assessment of my interests might be used to identify things about my inner self. And you might remember from a few years ago, there was a lot of reporting about Facebook knows you better than you know yourself, and these sort of psychographic experiments that showed by looking at the things you'd liked on Facebook, you can get this kind of analysis of, of what people are, who they are on the inside. Uh, and one of them that I thought was great was apparently likes taking naps as a <laughs> like uh, was an indicator of being a heterosexual man. So I thought that was quite a useful insight. Uh, but it's quite incredible when you see these sort of things. Like, I think curly fries was an indicator of intelligence. Um, or, or maybe not intelligence. I can't quite remember what it was. And, but, but, yeah, these kind of traces that are being used to make an inner picture of who you are without you really understanding what you're giving away. But it's scary, though. Like, we have talked so much in these sessions about technologies, innovations. We'll innovate ourselves out of everything. And we have these great tools now. We have AI and we have machine learning. But at the beginning of machine learning, there is like a very stereotypical person who interprets that data and inputs it. So the bias in machine learning is really difficult to overcome. And you talk about that in your book. Yeah, it is extremely difficult. Uh, and the way that we feed machine learning as well, I think is really disturbing. And again, in that sort of sense of not realizing what we're giving away. So when you look at sort of emotional analysis and psychographic analysis from biometrics, so from photographs, for example, you know, you might think facial recognition is just about knowing that I'm Susie because of my photograph. Mm -hmm. But actually, the way that um, technologists are, are looking at this is much more about you know, looking at my face and identifying from my face you know, what my sexual orientation is, what my political opinions are. And the way that this, uh, these technological techniques are developing is from photographs of, of all of us scraped off the internet. Um, in many cases, and sort of one of the richest sources of data is online dating. So because, you know, in online dating, you put your photograph up, you know, you show your best self, you indicate, you know, what gender of person or genders or whatever you're interested in finding. You might say, you know, what religion you are. You might indicate what your political views are because you want to find a like-minded person. And so all of that information which is out there on the internet has been used and scraped off. I mean, certainly the, the um, researchers in Stanford were scraping off dating websites in the UK, the US, and Canada, using that to train the technology to identify you know, what a gay face looks like, what a conservative face looks like, uh, and to use this. I mean, they say that they're, they're doing this to flag the dangers, but you know, there really is a fundamental question of whether you should ever be allowed to use technology to make these kind of inferences about people's in our lives. And so, yeah, if you've ever had your photograph on a dating website, it was probably used to train AI to identify people's sexual orientation, political orientation, possibly then to, you know, imprison them in countries around the world, 
possibly to you know, use it for voter suppression, to decide actually, you know, oh, we don't want you in the, in the voting booth uh, today just now, or, or you, know, you forgot your voter card because your photograph is showing up that maybe you're not the right kind of, of voter. These kind of developments are really fundamentally disturbing, not necessarily for you as the individual with your photograph, but it's kind of how that's being used to develop technology and what that might mean for our future democracy and, and, and the liberty of all of us. Just to make it a little scarier, you also have an angle on porn when it comes to <laughs> yeah. this? Yeah, I think as well, um, looking at, at pornography, and again, you know, going back to the question about free speech, what we've seen, the debates about online porn are really kind of a lightning rod for the kind of binary discussions that we often see uh, around you know, online information. We've got free speech on the one hand, you can't limit pornography online because that's a free speech question. On the other hand, we have particularly women's rights advocates you know, talking about the way pornography, online pornography and the ubiquity, particularly of violent pornography, is affecting the way women are treated uh, uh, and um, seen in the world. And it was uh, really interesting, one of the examples that I looked at was Iceland tried to ban online pornography about five years ago, a little bit longer now. And they, you know, in Iceland, pornography generally was banned, not because Icelanders don't like sex, but because they had this sort of ban on I suppose, emotionless sort of objectivization of sex and, and women in particular. But there was a massive kind of global campaign saying you can't do that because you know, this, is, you know, this is the thin end of the wedge which will lead to censorship and, and you know, we, this, this will destroy free speech globally. And so they backed off. But another way of looking at the porn issue online is how it's affecting people's minds. So how it's affecting porn users' minds. Uh, potentially, and there's certainly the Max Planck Institute did some research which showed there is conflicting research in this space, but there does seem to be a body of research that shows that aside from you know, the, the question of uh, porn addiction, which is you know, a minority, but that even non-addicted porn use does have impacts on brain function and brain development. And that is quite an astonishing idea that that is, you know, that that is affecting so many people around the world, particularly because in the online world it's, you know, it, it's out there, it's constantly being sort of presented. And, uh, and so I think it raises really big questions, not just about free speech, but also about our freedom to think for ourselves. And I don't know if you, you've come across as an Oxford philosopher, Amir Srinivasan, who wrote The Right to Sex. And she wrote a really interesting essay about talking to my students about porn. And, and her point as well was how sort of video sex, if you like, affects the sexual imagination. And that her students are actually really concerned about the way that this is affecting their own you know, ability to imagine their sexual freedom and their sexual future. And I think that is a really interesting question that has been very little explored in those debates. It's going back to kind of like owning your body and, uh, and owning your mind. Yeah. And we have a lot of innovators uh, at this festival, this group, and, and you have talked also a lot about how if we don't tackle this issue now, or like understanding how our brains are being influenced, it will stifle innovation in the long run. Absolutely. Uh, and you know, as a bit of a masochist, at the beginning of the pandemic, I went back to read 1984, and you won't be surprised <laughs> to hear that you know Orwell features throughout uh, throughout the book. And one of the interesting things in 1984 that I'd forgotten was that you know in the world of, of Orwell's 1984, he said you know scientists have been reduced to either uh, manipulating people's behaviour or working out how to kill people. Those are your two options in in, in Orwell's world. And when you think about how much of the direction of travel of technology is about is based on behaviorism, on determinism, on this idea that we can make people behave in this way by manipulating uh, their thoughts, it's got a very kind of disturbing echo. But one of the things that I found really interesting as well, um, looking in 2019, Tim Cook, the Apple CEO, gave an address to Stanford about what he called the freedom to be human. And when I read his speech, 
So, well, actually, he's talking about freedom of thought, but obviously he's not a human rights lawyer, so he doesn't know that he's talking about <laughs> freedom of thought. So he's calling it the freedom to be human. But he's talking about you know, that ability for our inner lives to develop, for us to change our minds, for us to think outside the box without necessarily telling people immediately. And you know, one of the, the important things about keeping your thoughts and opinions to yourself is that it gives you a chance to think through the pitfalls of what mm. you're thinking before you say it. And that, you know, going back to Twitter, on Twitter it's very easy to just you know, tweet something and then think, oh my God, what have I just said? <laughs> you know, yeah. Now it's, it's out there. <laughs> Whereas you know, in real life, in a real you know, space with a real audience, you're constantly thinking, okay, how do I put this? How, you know, how much do I want to share mm. in this space? And that actually allows you to develop mature ideas, mm. to innovate, you know, to think about, about how things could be, which is you know, what this festival is all about. And you know, Tim Cook in his, in his talk said, you know, Silicon Valley wouldn't exist if the kind of technology, the kind of interferences with our freedom of thought that we are all experiencing on a constant basis today had existed back in the 80s and 90s. That this capacity for innovation would not exist and that we need to be very careful and think about that. And that to me, you know, was a real wake-up call to actually it's in everyone's interests to think about how we protect freedom of thought and how we do that in tech innovation, you know, so that tech innovation doesn't eat itself. We look at Silicon Valley as like 10 years ago, they were like gods and now yeah. they're devils, right? And then and so you have like you unleash technology without consequences. In the beginning, it's the most wonderful, amazing thing that ever happened. I mean, getting my first iPhone was like, yeah. hallelujah. <laughs> but uh, but then, then it has shifted, but it hasn't necessarily become all bad. And one example that you use in your book is, is, is Apple, since we were talking about iOS. Uh, and they have, they, when they introduced their new uh, uh, iOS 21, Tell me what happened to the opt-in and the opt-out vis-a-vis sharing your um, uh, information with advertisers. Tell me what happened. Yeah, so Apple decided to make the default setting opting out of tracking you know, and uh, sharing your data with advertisers from your iPhone. So if you wanted to share with the world, you could still opt in. I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was I under... Do. I did my own work, yes. So uh, when they introduced this opt-in or opt-out in terms of sharing with advertisers, in the US, 95% of users opted, did not opt in. Yeah. And so that changed the whole landscape with Apple and iOS and 21 and like, in terms of like how much you know, uh, information got shared and how much better your privacy got protected. So sometimes it's just as simple as it was 85% in Europe. So yeah. the US, yay, a little bit ahead, but, you know, like, but, but still like it makes a difference yeah. in terms of sharing. And, and so that leads me to like really the next segment of the conversation, if you will. You're pretty hopeful despite having done all this research and so many devastating consequences of what's happening with the big tech companies and taking over our minds, you're optimistic. Tell, tell us about that, why? I am optimistic in various different ways. I mean, on a kind of, I suppose, community level, one of the, the stories that I found and that I wrote about in the book was a group of teenagers in the US who were gaming the Instagram algorithm. So they were sick of being fed advertising or being fed information based on their profiling. So they started sharing their devices and sharing their Instagram accounts so that they were logging in to different Instagram accounts from different places on different devices so that Instagram couldn't kind of tell who it was <laughs> that had this device. And they developed this really you know, complex system to effectively opt out of Instagram profiling. But that, for me, was kind of like, well, surely this shows the next generation don't want to be profiled. So surely the next innovation is, you know, how do we, d how do we design social media that is not based on this business model? You know, these are, these are young people making a huge amount of, I mean, I couldn't be bothered to do that, <laughs> uh, you know, a huge amount of effort to, to avoid the profiling. So that is, you know, I think that's one part of it. The other thing is that things are shifting. So one of the big drivers of this engine about profiling and targeting and understanding what we think and manipulating us is surveillance-based advertising. So it's advertising that uh, analyzes, you know, not that here's someone who's interested in going camping, so we're going to sell them a tent, but you know, here's you know, 
someone who is up all night on a dating app, clearly a little bit depressed, maybe they just lost their job, uh, you know, oh, they're, you know, they're going to a place where they're clearly having, you know, mental health uh, therapy, and therefore, you know, really what they need is some gambling. On online gambling, they can access it 24 hours a day, so, you know, let's, let's target them. And this is done on a kind of, you know, it's, a, it's on a, an immediate basis. And this is the sort of oil that's driving the information ecosystem, if you like. And so when I first started looking at this, talking about banning surveillance-based advertising was just like absolutely no way. You know, this is what this is the this is the money of you know Facebook, Google, all of these big companies, Amazon. This is what is making them massive. And people just saying, you know, well, they're, they're, you know, they're too big. They've got too much control. And you know, for me being British, it's uh, you know wh when I was doing the research as well, you know, looking at J.S. Mills on Liberty. You know, J.S. Mill worked for the East India Company while he was talking about freedom. You know, the East India Company was pretty much too big to fail when J.S. Mill was working there. It's not there now. You know, we're still dealing with the aftermath, but things change no matter how big and important they are. And what I've seen in the last year is a shift that people are realistically talking about banning surveillance advertising, even if it's only the, the thin end. So we see you know, President Biden in his State of the Union address starts talking about banning targeted advertising to children. Well, if you're banning it for children, why are you not banning it for their parents if it's so terrible? You know, the, targeting the parents is also affecting the children. In the European Union, we just saw the Digital Services Act go through which initially nobody dreamed you'd be able to get anything to do with surveillance-based advertising in. But, I mean, I haven't seen the, the draft that's been passed, but it's been reported that it's banning targeted advertising to children and banning targeted advertising based on sensitive data uh, about you. That is a massive shift, and it's thanks to, you know, we have a campaigner here from the Norwegian Consumer Council who's <laughs> been leading, you know, a transatlantic campaign on banning surveillance-based advertising. And that is starting to shift. You know, mainstream politicians are starting to talk about it. And I think if you take the money driver away mm. from this whole, um, you know, this whole system, then innovation will go in a different direction because the money will come from somewhere else. It won't be in people's interests. It won't be in people's financial interests to extract, you know, our inner lives for manipulation. Uh, and there are other ways as well that I think regulation can can stop these directions of travel to leave innovation to go in a different direction. But we can't really wait for regulation and for government to like solve these problems for us. Uh, for us. Mm -hmm. Like we have to act as consumers, right? And be responsible consumers and take the matter into our own hands. Because if not, you just can sit around and wait for yeah. too long. And it, it's noticeable when you travel from the US to Europe and like every time you go on a website, it's like they're asking you for the cookies. Like, and I'm like, Ugh. Yeah. After a while, you just get tired of doing it. And it's like, I know it's lazy and I should reject all cookies, but you do it because it's a consumer behavior that we're used to. Mm -hmm. But so what kind of tools can we ourselves use to protect ourselves better from <coughs> being manipulated at all times? I mean, as an individual, honestly, at the moment, it's very difficult. You know, the best thing you can do is throw your phone in the sea. So when you're jumping <laughs> in the sea later, leave your phone in the sea. That's, you know, that, that's the first stage. Um, and our phones and the way we're all so reliant on them that everything is, is going through our phones. You know, this Facebook knows you better than you know yourself. You know, recent research has shown that actually your phone is even more granular. So you don't need to be on Facebook. If you've got a phone, someone takes your phone, they can read the metadata. It's not even what you've written on your phone, right? It's the metadata. And they can tell a huge amount about you just from your phone. So it's very difficult in practice, particularly if you need your phone to get on the train, to do your banking, you know, to contact you your friends and family. You need the phone for everything. In exactly. Norway, oh my God, you can't do anything. You can't go on a bus without your phone or yeah. without uh, an app, right? So that so does make it quite difficult. Yeah. And that's why on the one hand, you do need uh, the regulation. But I think one of the things as well is shifting your mindset, understanding, and that's what I wanted to do in the book, is that you know, this isn't about privacy and whether someone knows your date of birth. It is about people wanting to know and having access to your inner life on a, you know, in, in real time uh, and using that information to manipulate you in, in different ways, whether that's political or whether it's consumer. Mm -hmm. So I think understanding how that affects you. So for me, using this um, you know, Twitter app to understand 
you know, it's, it's called, it was apply secret source. You can run your social media through it and it tells you who you are. So for me, you know, I, I Hello, use Twitter. Hello, 30-year-old man. Absolutely, but I, I use Twitter for work primarily. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not sitting there being an emotion, over-emotional <laughs> middle-aged woman on Twitter. I try not to. And occasionally it slips through and then I have to delete it. But, you know, I, and, and you can use, a, you know, a, a Twitter delete app, which I actually do. I, on a weekly basis, automatically my Twitter feed is deleted so that whatever I was feeling on a, you know, difficult moment 10 years ago uh, is not suddenly, hopefully, going to come back and haunt me. Although, of course, people can take screenshots. But, you know, so, so being aware of how much is out there and how it's being used. And, and again, I go back to the point that even if they get you completely wrong, that can still be used to discriminate against you. It doesn't matter if they've got you wrong. But understanding how, how pervasive it is, supporting digital rights activists, you know, finding campaigners who are dealing with this and supporting the work that they're doing. I think once you understand what it means to you, what it means to your family, what it means to all of our futures, mm -hmm. then that shifts. And I think what's really exciting for me about being in this space is, you know, when you're talking about impact investors, you know, you have the power to influence the direction of future technology. And when you think about something, you know, like Facebook, you know, back in the day, you know, Mark Zuckerberg turns up, says, I'm going to have this fantastic global community. It's going to be incredible. You know, we're going to be able to share information in ways we never have before. It's going to be absolutely beautiful. We're going to be able to keep in touch. And, you know, I am on Facebook. You know, full disclosure, I'm on Facebook. I've got friends all around the world. Uh, you know, this is going to be fabulous. You know, nobody putting money into Facebook probably thought about the implications of Facebook facilitating genocide in Myanmar. But you know, maybe if they'd asked a human rights person, they might have flagged where the problems might be. They might have flagged what you need to tweak, what you need to look out for, what you should be concerned about, and in some cases, where you should just say no and walk away. Uh, and I think getting in at that early stage and really thinking about human rights implications, and that's not, you know, AI ethics, it's not a kind of, you know, well, we're going to ask someone in the company who's been promoted to the business and human rights thing. <laughs> it's, about, it's about talking to the people who are dealing with human rights issues on the ground. You know, getting, getting advice mm. about what, what's the worst case scenario here. And I think, you know, sometimes as a, as a human rights person, you can feel like you're walking in and raining on the parade. But it's not about raining on the parade. It's about, you know, making sure that the parade doesn't turn into a riot that you know, you've thought about how you're going to clear up the mess afterwards, and maybe thought about you know, what rainwear you're going to need for the parade in case it rains. Right. You know, it's really about, about framing that. And I, you know, I genuinely hope that this might be a moment of shift towards innovating in a different direction and taking account of those, those risks. Yeah. Really good ending note, but we do have seven minutes left. So I would like to bring in some questions from you guys about this topic. So, in, unless, of course, here we go, technology still works. Uh, are there any questions out there? We have seven minutes left. Dead. So first off, really great book. You guys should totally check it out. <laughs> like the key points of having evolved to where we are today around the human rights side of this conversation? Yeah, I suppose, I mean, w what I found as well when I looked at, you know, when I started looking at freedom of thought and it's, it's a right that has been very much neglected since it was, you know, um, put into the Universal Declaration on Human Rights in the 1940s, it's been pretty much ignored and partly because People have assumed, they sort of said, well, yes, the freedom of thought is absolute, but of course no one can get inside our heads, so what's the problem? But when I then looked back historically, it was like, well, that's never really been true. And that, you know, historically people have always been trying to get inside our heads and manipulate how we think. And so I looked at you know, things like the power of the church and how you know, Galileo questioning whether or not uh, the sun moved around the earth and not the other way you know, landed him up with 
threat of torture, potentially death sentence, uh, and left under house arrest because this is, you know, such a horrendous thing. And interestingly, what he was being prosecuted for was holding that belief. It, it wasn't saying it, although obviously if he just held it quietly at home, you know, maybe he, he would have been able to get out more. But it was, you know, looking at these historical examples and again through sort of the development of psychiatry, things like physiognomy, you know, the history of judging people by their faces, which is now being automated. But what we then saw in the 1940s and 50s with, with human rights law being codified at the international level was this coming together in the aftermath of the Second World War. And that's one of the things, again, you know, that looking today, we can all feel totally helpless. I'm pretty sure people in the 1930s were feeling that as well, this horrendous you know, anxiety about what's going on around us and helplessness. But what came out of that was this international agreement on the fundamental planks of what we need to be human and what we need to be free. And this idea of freedom of thought, when I looked at how it had been discussed by, you know, by the drafters, it was really interesting how it brought together so many different threads. So it brought together people like Charles Malik, who was a Lebanese uh, Christian philosopher, who was looking at this as the idea of the spirit of humanity, you know, what it means to be human, the human spark, if you like. Mm. Whereas the, the Soviets, who were much more concerned with sort of social rights and, and economic rights, but they saw freedom of thought as opposed to freedom of religion and belief as a protection for science and innovation. And that this was, you know, this was, they, they described it as a protection for the martyrs of science. And you then get as well a Confucian idea of Ren and the idea of, you know, freedom of thought also being about freedom to connect, if you like, and freedom to understand who we are and who we are as humanity. But the other thing that I, when I was looking at the history of human rights was, you know, I looked a bit at the fight between the US, France and the UK as, as sort of claiming to be the origins of human rights law and, you know, the human rights as we know them today. But that actually, when you look at things like, um, you know, the, the bills of rights in, the UK or in England, in, in France, in the US, they were rights for white men, basically, often white men with money. You know, women and people of color did not actually come mm -hmm. into this space at all until the 1950s. So there was this sort of history of a philosophical idea of freedom of thought and human rights, but it didn't actually apply to everyone. It was only in the 20th century that that idea that actually we are all humans um, Pretty, pretty new idea, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's, it's radically, I mean, even when you look at the, the French Revolution, you know, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, and this female philosopher, Olympe de Gouges, you know, had the temerity to write the Declaration on the Rights of Women. And I mean, she lost her head pretty fast after that. Despite all the, you know, freedom, liberty, fraternity, equality, it, it didn't quite go to the rights of women. <laughs> There's one more, one more question. Um, so I have um, a question on a and I'm a firm believer of freedom of thinking and freedom of thought and I've looked at marketing IDs and that used to be my world so I know that very intimately. Um, how about the other side of this? And yesterday we were having this discussion, a lot of the folks who have not been able to get beyond the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, feed my children. And we were also discussing that the world order, the way it's going, human consciousness has to be elevated or provided support to kind of, from free thinking, just overall. So how do we, so some of this has also been used to promote meditation in third world countries and um, b giving tools so that you can actually uplift human consciousness, which is absolutely going to be needed. So how do you create a balance between this? And then I won't go into the whole psychedelic discussion, yeah. but the banning of that and religion in itself, in some ways, cap, you know, uh, limited freedom of thinking. So how does all of that kind of balance out? Um, maybe too many questions, but I'll let no, you address I, I think whatever it, you want. I think it's a very good question. I don't have, uh, well, I have one clear answer and then a lot of less clear answers. So one of the things, as I was saying earlier, is that this right to inner freedom is protected absolutely in international human rights law. And that's along with uh, the prohibition on slavery and the prohibition on torture. They're the three really key absolute rights. Most other rights you can limit for other reasons. So you can limit privacy or freedom of expression for public health or national security or you know, any, any number of, uh, of reasons. But this inner freedom you can't. 
So the big question is, what exactly is protected and where are the lines? And I think the, the question that you raise is a really good one, and it's one of the issues, I think, with some of the innovation in the tech for good space is this kind of, oh, we can influence people to behave like this, and it'll be much better for all of us. You know, you see it as well with environmental action and the, this sort of thing. And what I would say is you, what you need to find is where is that line between legitimate influence and manipulation? And that is the question which, at the moment, the legal line is not defined because this right hasn't been developed. Uh, and so there isn't a clear answer, but I think it's something you absolutely need to be thinking about when you're in this space. And, you know, I, I've spent 25 years being a human rights advocate. You know, my job is influencing people. You know, I've been influencing policymakers. I've written a book to influence the general public. You know, I'm hoping to influence impact investors, but I hope that I'm not doing it on the wrong side of the manipulation uh, line. Uh, and so it's, it's a complex question. Um, and you're absolutely right that, you know, it's, well, freedom of thought should not be a luxury, but your ability to think beyond the box, you know, out of the box, is about not having to think where the next meal is coming from completely. Um, you know, it, it, it's also about getting information, communicating with other people. Uh, so, you know, all of those things go together to how we form our opinions, how we experience uh, freedom. Um, and obviously, you know, some people's thoughts are pretty obnoxious to other people's freedom. But that is also why you have this uniquely protected space, that as soon as people start acting on it or, or speaking about what they think, then they have to take the consequences uh, of that, because that is about, you know, protecting society. But that ability to maybe have dreadful thoughts and change them or have dreadful thoughts and think, OK, I realize these are so dreadful, I need to keep this very much to myself and, and no one else should ever know this. <laughs> that is, you know, that is an important part of that, of that freedom and, and, a, and an important part of our ability to socialize with each other and sort of develop the societies we want. So I don't have a clear answer, but hopefully there will be one, one day. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mia uh, yeah. and Susie. <laughs> Uh, are you? I was just going to say thank you to all you guys for being here. Thank you, Susie, for writing this book. It's incredibly important. And I encourage you all to read it because it has so much data and so much new information and so Not many thoughtful data. pieces <laughs> <laughs> that I, 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 I know it will be worth your time. So, uh, again, thank you very much, everybody. And thank, thank you. Thanks so much for having me.